Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Kelly Jean Kelly and Katie Weaver. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Kelly Jean Kelly. Many news stories about the United States government tell about Congress and American lawmakers. The U.S. Congress is the nation's legislature. It is made of two parts the Senate, and the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is called the House for short, and sometimes it is called the People's House. That term was chosen as a nickname because the men who wrote the U.S. Constitution in 1787 set few restrictions on who could serve there. They wanted the House to be as close as possible to everyday Americans. One of the writers of the Constitution, James Madison, wrote about the House years later. He noted, The door of this part of the federal government is open to merit of every description, whether native or adoptive, whether young or old, and without regard to poverty or wealth, or to any particular profession of religious faith. In other words, House members can be born in the United States or in any other country. They can be as young as 25 years old or, as some members have been, into their 90s. They do not have to be rich, and they do not have to belong to any religion. However, in reality, for many years, only free white men were permitted to serve as lawmakers. Women and other groups had limited legal rights, to say the least. However, as laws changed over time, members of the House also changed. The website of the U.S. House of Representatives notes, The House's first African-American member, was elected in 1870. The first Hispanic member took office in 1877, the first woman member in 1917, the first Asian American member in 1957, and the first African American woman member in 1969. The country's constitution writers also made the terms for House members short, compared to the President and Senators, only two years. One reason is so House members would have to stay in close contact with the people who live in the area they represent. Otherwise, voters would soon have a chance to push them out of office. One of the other central ideas about the House of Representatives is that known as proportional representation. The idea was that each member of the House would represent 30,000 U.S. citizens. That situation would enable states with large populations to send more lawmakers to Congress. But the Constitution writers of 1787 struggled with how to count a state's population. At that time, more than 650,000 enslaved people lived in the country. After much debate, the Constitution writers decided the enslaved population would be only partly counted for legal and tax purposes. The decision is known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. The first U.S. House of Representatives had 67 members. As the country's population grew, 
the number of House members increased from 105 to 142, and so on. After the approval of constitutional amendments following the Civil War, most formerly enslaved people were fully counted in the state's population. The House continued to grow into the 20th century. Finally, in 1929, Lawmakers officially limited the total number of House members to 435. Today, each member of the House represents about 700,000 people. Members of the House, along with the Senators, develop national laws. They also help voters who live in their districts deal with problems related to the government and members of the House have other important jobs. They can investigate people with government ties who are suspected of wrongdoing. For example, members of the House have looked into cases of bribery, corruption, and abuses of power. In the 1950s, the House and american Activities Committee demanded information from private citizens suspected of communist activity. But critics said the committee had gone too far. In time, the Supreme Court limited Congress's power to investigate issues related to the law instead of people's private beliefs. Over its history, the House has brought impeachment charges against government officials, including presidents, more than 60 times, but only a few officials were removed from office. Of those, some were federal judges accused of being drunk at court. Members of Congress also have what some call the power of the purse. In other words, they control how the government spends public money. The House of Representatives website explains that the Constitution writers wanted to put spending decisions in the hands of the people's representatives in Congress. Similarly, the Constitution writers did not want the chief executive to decide alone whether to take the country to war. They wanted to make war difficult to enter. They also wanted to prevent the president from going to war because of political or personal interests. So they wrote that the Congress had the power to declare war. But in truth, lawmakers have only officially declared war 11 times. The last time was in 1942. Since then, Congress has simply approved the use of military force. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. Every day, around 50 tons of food waste arrives at a factory outside of Jinan, China. That is equal to the weight of seven adult elephants. Once it arrives, the food waste goes through pipes and into individual cells made of wood. There, about one billion cockroaches wait to feed. People usually see these insects as dirty pests, but in China, they are seen for their environmental and economic value. Ever-growing Chinese cities like Jinan are creating more food waste than they have room for in landfills. Cockroaches are not only able to get rid of food waste, they can become healthy food for farm animals. The insect's remains are even said to offer cures for stomach problems and other health issues in humans. Liu Yusheng is president of Shandong Insect Industry Association. Liu calls cockroaches a biotechnological pathway 
for turning kitchen waste into something useful. The food waste arrives at the Jinan factory before the sun rises. Shandong Jiaobin Agricultural Technology Company operates the factory. It has plans to open three more next year and hopes to process one-third of the food waste produced by Jinan's seven million people. A recent spread of African swine fever led China to ban the use of food waste as food for pigs. But cockroaches that eat the food waste can become a protein-rich source of food for pigs and other farm animals. Shandong Chiaobin chairwoman Li Hongyi describes the process as turning trash into resources. Thousands of kilometers away, in a small village in Sichuan province, Li Bingzai has similar ideas. Li, who is 47, used to sell mobile phones. He has invested 1 million yuan, about $143,000, in cockroaches. He sells them to pig farms and fisheries. He also sells them to drug companies, which use the insects in medicine. And sometimes the cockroaches provide a tasty treat for his family. Lee's farm now has 3.4 million cockroaches. People think it's strange that I do this kind of business, Lee said. It has great economic value, and my goal is to lead other villagers to prosperity if they follow my lead. His village currently has two farms, but Lee's goal is to create 20. In the Sichuan city of Xichang, a company called Good Doctor has about 6 billion cockroaches. It claims it is the biggest cockroach farm in the world and uses artificial intelligence, or AI, to both control and grow its roach population. Cockroaches live for about six months. Once they die, the insects are treated with steam. Next, they are washed and dried. Then, the clean remains are sent to a huge nutrient removal container. The extracts are then used in medicines that Good Doctor produces. Wen Jian Guo oversees the Good Doctor Cockroach Center. Wen says the cockroach extracts can be used for treating ulcers, skin wounds, and even stomach cancer. The South China Morning Post recently reported that about 40 million people in China use Good Doctor's cockroach extract to treat stomach problems and other sicknesses. The company sells to 4,000 hospitals around the country. The cockroaches at Good Doctor never leave the controlled, warm, dark area that Wen oversees. But could the farm's six billion insects ever escape? Wen admits a mass escape would make for a good disaster movie. But he has taken steps to prevent that from ever happening. We have a moat filled with water and fish, Wen said. If the cockroaches escape, they will fall into the moat, and the fish will eat them all. From VOA Learning English, welcome to The Making of a Nation, our weekly program of American history for people learning English. I'm Steve Ember. We've been discussing the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. He was America's third president, elected in 1800. 
In our last program, we talked about the dispute between Jefferson and the Chief Justice of the United States. Jefferson believed the Constitution gave Congress the right to decide the country's laws. But Chief Justice John Marshall believed the Supreme Court had the final say. The two men's beliefs were tested in a case called Marbury versus Madison. John Marshall's arguments won. He wrote a decision saying the Supreme Court had the power to rule on the laws that Congress passed. The Supreme Court did not act on that power during Jefferson's administration. But John Marshall's decision did help establish the role of the Supreme Court in the American government. The Marbury versus Madison case is one of the important legacies of Jefferson's presidency. But historian Joseph Ellis says it was not the only one. The major achievement of Jefferson's presidency is the Louisiana Purchase which is a lot of luck, as well as his willingness to take advantage of the luck. The story of the Louisiana Purchase begins with France and Spain. The two European countries wanted to limit the power of the United States. So in 1800, Spain and France entered into a secret treaty. In the treaty, Spain gave France control of a large area in North America called the Louisiana Territory. The Louisiana Territory stretched north to south from the Gulf of Mexico to Canada, and it stretched east to west from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains. The area was important not only for its large size, it also included some valuable navigation features, including where the Mississippi River opened into the Gulf of Mexico. Napoleon Bonaparte ruled France at that time. Jefferson did not want Napoleon in North America. He felt the French presence was a threat to the peace of the United States. He decided to try to buy parts of the Louisiana Territory, especially around the mouth of the Mississippi River near the city of New Orleans. Jefferson sent James Monroe to Paris as a special negotiator, but Monroe never had a chance to offer the American position. Napoleon had decided to sell everything to the Americans. He told his finance minister to give up Louisiana, all of it. Napoleon needed money for a war with Britain. James Monroe was happy to negotiate the purchase of Louisiana. They agreed on a price of 80 million francs for all the land drained by the Great Mississippi River and all its many streams. The Louisiana Purchase nearly doubled the size of the United States at that time. It included the present-day states of Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, and Nebraska. It stretched into parts of Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, and Louisiana. The Louisiana Purchase also opened the Mississippi River to American commerce and travel. Historian Andrew O'Shaughnessy says that as a result of this access, the Louisiana Purchase fueled the country's economic expansion in the 19th century. And Mr. O'Shaughnessy says the Louisiana Purchase created more opportunities for Americans to own land. It was very important to Jefferson because he really wanted every uh, free member of society to be able to own 
land. He regarded land ownership as, in many ways, essential to someone's independence and their ability, therefore, to participate in a Republican government. But both Mr. O'Shaughnessy and historian Joseph Ellis say the Louisiana Purchase went against Jefferson's beliefs about central government. Joseph Ellis says that in many ways, Jefferson's presidency aimed to make the federal government almost invisible and to limit the president's power. And the uh, Louisiana Purchase is the most authoritative executive action in American presidential history. One president decides to buy the Midwest, and, um, and he does it unilaterally. Historians say the Louisiana Purchase is one example of Jefferson's contradictory character, in which he says one thing, but does another. Andrew O'Shaughnessy adds that Jefferson made trade-offs. When he bought Louisiana, Jefferson used presidential power in a way that was not specifically permitted by the Constitution. But Mr. O'Shaughnessy says, Jefferson was also looking to the higher good. In the case of the Louisiana Purchase, the good of improving the country's political health. Federalists in the early 1800s also questioned Jefferson's decision to buy Louisiana. They feared it would weaken the power of the states of the Northeast. Federalist leaders made a plan to form a new government of those states. But to succeed, they needed the state of New York. Their plan for a new government led to another memorable episode in American history. Aaron Burr was vice president during Thomas Jefferson's first term. Burr became a candidate for New York governor. The Federalists believed Burr would win the election, become governor, and support their plan. But Federalist leader Alexander Hamilton did not trust Burr. The two had been enemies for a long time. Hamilton made some strong statements against Burr during the election campaign in New York. The comments later appeared in several newspapers. Burr lost the New York election. The Federalist plan for a new government of Northeastern states died. New York historian Valerie Paley says Burr heard about Hamilton's strong comments. He was offended. He called him something like despicable. It, it hinged on a word, one word, and a word as simple as despicable. Burr asked Hamilton to admit or deny the comments. Hamilton refused. The two men exchanged more notes. Burr was not satisfied with Hamilton's answers. He believed Hamilton had attacked his honor. Burr demanded a duel. A duel is a fight, usually with guns. Valerie Paley says in those days, gentlemen often used duels to settle rivalries and defend their honor. So it wasn't so much uh, these men dueled to kill, they would uh, purposely miss their shots and then everything, the air would be cleared. Hamilton opposed duels, yet he agreed to fight Burr on July 11, 1804. The two men met at Weehawken, New Jersey, just across the Hudson River from New York City. The duel would take place by the water's edge at the bottom of a high rock wall. The guns were loaded. Burr and Hamilton took their places. One of Hamilton's friends explained the rules. Are you ready, gentlemen, he asked. Both answered yes. There was a moment of silence. He gave the signal. Burr and Hamilton raised their guns. Two shots split the air. Hamilton raised up on his toes 
then fell to the ground. Burr remained standing. He looked at Hamilton with regret, then left. Hamilton died the next day. He was not yet 50. Valerie Paley says Hamilton's story is almost like a television or newspaper drama. He was extremely attractive, and he had such a romantic story. Here he is, the, the immigrant boy from the West Indies, uh, you know, made good, comes to New York, goes to King's College, becomes a you know, sort of a self-taught lawyer, becomes aide-de-camp to Washington, all sorts of extraordinary things, marries so well, and and also has this vision of what modern America might become, and in many ways was able to implement at least early, an early bit of that vision before his death. Hamilton had made a big impact on the United States. He had created a national bank and influenced many government policies. Newspapers throughout the nation reported his death. Most people accepted the news calmly. To them, it was simply the sad end to an old private dispute. In the months after Hamilton's death, the nation prepared for the next presidential election. Once again, the Republican Party chose Thomas Jefferson as its candidate for president. But the Republicans refused to support Aaron Burr for vice president again. Instead, they chose George Clinton. Clinton had served as governor of New York seven times. The Federalist Party chose Charles Coatsworth Pinckney of South Carolina as its candidate for president. It chose Rufus King of New York to be its vice presidential candidate. The campaign was quiet. In those days, candidates did not make many speeches. Republican pamphlets told of the progress made during the past four years. The former Federalist administration raised taxes, they said. Jefferson ended many of the taxes. The Federalists borrowed millions of dollars. Jefferson borrowed none. And Jefferson got the Louisiana Territory without going to war. The Federalists could not dispute these facts. They expected that Jefferson would be re-elected, but they were sure their candidate would get as many as 40 electoral votes. The results shocked the Federalists. Jefferson received 162 electoral votes. Pinckney received just 14. One man tried to explain the meaning of Jefferson's great victory. He was John Quincy Adams, son of former President John Adams. President Adams had been a firm Federalist. This is what his son said. The power of Jefferson's administration rests on a strong majority of the American people. The president has great popular support. His re-election shows that the experiment of the Federalists has failed. It never can and never will be brought to life again. To try to bring it back would be foolish. It would be like trying to put life into a body that has been buried for years. After the election of 1804, only seven Federalists remained in the United States Senate. Only 25 remained in the House of Representatives. Thomas Jefferson would be president for another four years. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.